Is it two guitar parts? Is it one part? What guitar is he playing? What's up, beloveds? JB Eckel here. Welcome to the channel. On today's rock explaining, we're going to dive deep into the wild, sparkling genius of Mr. Jimmy Page and the mysterious, misunderstood guitars of Led Zeppelin's classic, When the Levee Breaks. <laughs> Jimmy Page has always been sort of a creative touchstone for me over the decades. When I'm low on inspiration, I can usually zoom in on some aspect of his work with Led Zeppelin, and I'll get all fired up again to do something interesting. And that has definitely been the case with today's topic. Even if you're not a guitar player or a musician, you might want to stick around because the creativity of this stuff is pretty mind-blowing. But be forewarned, folks. It gets nerdy. The other night I went down a rabbit hole trying to learn the real guitar part from When the Levy Breaks. You guys know the song. It's the thunderous ending track from Led Zeppelin's fourth and biggest selling album, which we all call Led Zeppelin 4, but was really titled with four unexplained symbols or sigils. Um, which reminds me, that's why I'm rocking this Zoso today. Uh, I don't understand what it means but it brings up all the warm and fuzzy Zeppelin-y associations for me. This song is so cool, it manages to hold its own on the same album with big Zepp flagships like Black Dog. The great rock and roll song simply called Rock and Roll. And some other deep album cuts that you've probably never heard of. Clocking in at over seven minutes long, When the Levee Breaks is a heavy, swampy, atmospheric track and a really interesting choice for an album closer. It was almost never played um, in Zeppelin's live shows for reasons that might become clear in this video, but it remains a huge fan favorite and we all love it. Now, whenever people discuss this song, it's always about the drums, which is understandable because it's got to be the most iconic rock drum track in history, famously tracked in an echoing stairwell, sampled on countless hip hop songs, etc., etc. Probably the best commentary about the drum sound is Rick Beato's video about it from 2019, which I'll link to for you in the description. In some ways, this video is a continuation of Rick's because what he did for clearing up the story about the drums on this song, I would like to do for the guitars. So I dedicate this one to you, Mr. Beato. I shook your hand at the NAMM show one time and you were nice to me. The other topic that does get discussed somewhat is the fact that this song is actually a cover of an old blues record from 1929. And Led Zeppelin did give writing credit to the original artist, Memphis Minnie. Although the credits still got it partly wrong because Minnie's duo partner, Kansas Joe McCoy, also co-wrote it. But Zeppelin still gets points for trying and for not getting sued on this one by the very artists to whom they were paying homage. But that's not our focus today. We're here for the guitars. This is a song I've never really analyzed guitar-wise until now. But I should have known that if I took the time... I'd uncover some crazy gems as always. I have to say that studying this actually gave me a huge burst of creative energy this week that I've been channeling into all kinds of other stuff. Jimmy Page was never just searching for the right guitar part for a song. He was always going for something magical and evocative, something that would pull you in and take you on a trip. So this nerd journey of mine turned into a major investigation trying to figure out what exactly is going on with these guitars. Zeppelin seems somehow both over-documented and shrouded in mystery at the exact same time. All I originally wanted to do here was figure out if Page was playing a 12-string guitar or not. But I wound up in a labyrinth of lore and information and misinformation that led, if you will, to this topic. 
For one thing, Page never really talks about this guitar part in any of his interviews. Like everyone else, he's always focusing on the drums and the production. Also, of all the tons of guitar tutorials for this song on YouTube, none of them reference the actual part that Page plays on the record. At first, I was confused about this, but then it made total sense because, as you'll see, it's completely impractical to play it the way he does, especially on a live gig. And maybe that's why he barely ever played this song live. The good news is that some tutorials do teach you more usable ways to play it in a band setting. And I'll link to a really in-depth one by Gretchen Men from Zeparella in the description. Lastly, the guitar blends into the mix on this song a little more than usual for Led Zeppelin. The main conversation seems to be going on between the huge drum groove and Robert Plant's harmonica, which is up front and heavily distorted with backwards echo and takes up a lot of space. So the guitar is a little deceptive because it's not that prominent for much of the song. Now here's how I remember the riff in my head. It's nothing like his actual part. It's based on what I would think Jimmy Page might play, but not what he really did. And this is probably how you hear it too, maybe. If someone called this song on the bandstand or at a jam session, this is what I would play. So the version in my brain would have been fairly distorted and it would have doubled the bass line, but that's not it. It's not even close, as we'll see. An important production note on When the Levee Breaks is that the whole song was slowed down on tape after it was recorded. So the version we know is slower and lower than the way the band originally played it. In my opinion, this was a typical stroke of production genius on Page's part because slowing down the track exaggerates the kind of surreal sludgy groove that it has and all the instruments are resonating a little lower than they should because they're actually slowed down. This is relevant to the guitar discussion because it lowers the song's key and it makes it harder to figure out what the guitar tuning really was in the original key of whatever it was. On the album, the song is in the ballpark of the key of F and the tempo um, hovers around 71, 72 BPM. Originally, it must have been at least in F sharp, if not G, and around 76 BPM or even faster, which is very hard to picture on this song. But whatever the original key was, in this video, we'll be referring to it as the key of F, which is where we're all used to hearing it on the record. So let's talk about what we hear in the guitar. There are some seeming contradictions in the part. We hear some doubled strings, we hear non-doubled strings, we hear pick, finger picking, heavy effects, no effects at times. Is it two guitar parts? Is it one part? What guitar is he playing? Here's what we actually know. Number one, Page's sound. For a classic hard rock song, the guitar is surprisingly clean with very little amp overdrive and it's a ringy, twangy tone. The whole hard rock vibe of the track is actually coming from the drums. Page is playing almost pure country blues on this whole thing. There are no heavy or fuzzy guitar sounds until the slide melody starts way into the song. Number two, the guitar itself. It definitely sounds like a 12 string a lot of the time and Page is known to have used two different 12 strings on this album, a uh, Vox and a Fender. And even though I have this double neck here in tribute to Mr. Page, he actually didn't get one of these until after Led Zeppelin IV was out, and he got it so that he could play the 12 and 6 string parts of the songs on stage during the same song, like Stairway to Heaven. But there's one caveat to the 12-string thing. Mainly, I never once hear a high third-string octave like you normally notice on a 12-string guitar, but rather just a single, regular-tuned third-string. It really makes sense, though, because the classic high-octave sound you hear on Birds and Beatles records 
would be way too bright and shiny for the darker vibe of this track. So I actually took that string off the guitar and now it sounds much closer. And just to add to the confusion, there's a tape flanging effect off and on throughout the guitar part, which can almost help you get there on a, on a six string guitar if you use a flanger pedal, but not quite. And for sure you need a slide because if you've been avoiding slide like me, then this is a good excuse to get into it. You're gonna need one. Number three, the tuning. Here's where it gets wild. People always say that this song is tuned to an open G and then slowed down to open F or a crazy F tuning like FAC, FAC or something or other. But that isn't what we're hearing on the original track. Those tunings can absolutely help you play this song in a band, but you can't play Paige's actual part. To play it like he does, I'm pretty sure you need to be an open E with a capo at the first fret for an open F tuning. This is challenging because uh, capo makes the action too low to play slide, so you keep buzzing out on the frets. So I had to crank my action up really high for this song. In the original key of F sharp, say, the capo would have had to be on the second fret before they slowed the tape down. But for us, it's F, so capo on the first fret. And now it gets even weirder. This part only sounds right and is a lot easier to play if you tune the doubled high D string down to a fifth instead of the usual octave. So normally, the fourth string or the D string on a 12 would sound like this. And then the, the octave string would be way up here. But what we have here, what I'm pretty sure is happening is that they're, they sound like this. So the two D strings, quote unquote, are not playing the same pitch and octave apart the way they normally would. The high one is playing a fifth, which in the key of F is a C note. So it's like a droning power chord on one string, really two strings the whole time. This was a huge discovery for me. It's not that surprising at all that Paige would be into weird tunings. For one thing, both he and Robert Plant were kind of obsessed with Joni Mitchell at the time, as was everyone else. This same album has the song Going to California, which is sort of their ode to Joni. And she was famous for using a different tuning on almost every song, which influenced a lot of other artists, including Mr. Page. So what I'm trying to say is that it sounds to me like Page played an open E tuned 12 string electric guitar with one string taken off and one D tuned down to a fifth, capoed at the second fret for F sharp, played with a pick and fingers using a slide through a clean amp with almost no distortion. And then they slowed the whole tape down to F. Oh yeah, and then add heavy tape flanging just for fun. Think about the creative mindset of that. All of this on a part that's kind of in the background. And friends, I am not saying that this is what he actually did. It was 50 years ago, so we'll never know the truth. Even Paige might not know. What I am saying is that this is the only way I could get it to sound anything like the record. So that's my big disclaimer. Okay, so there are four main parts to the song. The big surprise is that the guitar never actually plays some of the big riffs in the usual Zeppelin unison style that we expect. It's way more intricate than that and tricky to play. Part one, the main riff. There are a few homegrown ways to play this, one of which I showed you a minute ago with the slide. But as you can see, I ended up not using the slide in the track. I ended up bending with my second finger on that string, on the doubled string, because it just sounded closer to the record that way. 
but you could play it with a slide. And I'll, I'll just show you in kind of like a slow motion version of it, of what it sounds like. And of course, it gets crazier. There's a little mystery slide guitar part on beat two and four of every bar during the main riff. You have to listen super close, but once you hear it, it's obvious. Here's what it does. So it's going like... You hear that, and it might even be a whole chord. It's, it's hard to pick it out. I, I'm kind of hearing a whole chord. Not on a 12 string because you get too many high notes. You get too much of that. But it's there. And I'm almost 100% sure it's an overdub, maybe even an acoustic guitar. But check this out. You can actually play it all in one part if you're the risk-taking type. So I'm going to butcher it for you. It's really weird to play, but it's also kind of cool. How much mojo is that, though? What's up, Jimmy Page? Part two is the slide section and the bass riff. Lots of cool stuff going on here. It definitely sounds like a 12-string to me. This is so cool. As I mentioned before, the second part of this big riff is never really played on the guitar the way you think it will be. It's all bass. You remember it as a heavy low guitar riff, but it's not. He seems to resist the urge to play in unison with the bass like he does on so many other Zeppelin riffs. Instead, Page's guitar part stays clean, harmonizes chords with the bass, and continues this chimey droning sound. Here's the guitar part all by itself. <laughs> And he does something notable and strange here. He starts the riff with the F that would rub up against the E flat in the bass. Dun -na, dun -na. So it's going. Dun -na, dun -na. It's only a whole step apart and it would rub up against each other if he held on to it any longer, but it goes by so quickly you don't hear it. And then he ends the riff without playing the root. Instead, he plays C, the fifth, on as many strings as possible. So it's... So instead of going... He's going... Except in tune. I actually counted how many strings are playing a C note here. Six strings in total. Okay? You've got one, two the doubled second string. Then you've got the third string. Then you've got the detuned fourth string octave, which is now playing a C also. And then you've got these guys, including the fifth string, which you don't hear very much in this song. So you end up with this wall of C. And you hear this huge buildup resonating on that note. And... I wouldn't be surprised if he double tracked the whole thing on top of it. If you listen to the track, you'll notice this like, it's like a big thing on C. Would I ever do this? No way. Is it kind of wrong and weird? Yes. Would I change it? Never in a million years. Part three, the chord section leading into the slide break. Now, originally I thought it was played like this, one D minor chord shape, with the drone strings ringing all the way through it because you can hear them. And that would totally work on a gig. If I was playing it, that's probably what I would do during that section. But listening closer, I noticed that the chords had a lower voice in them like this.
I was positive it was the other way until I noticed that little and that creates a problem because now you can't play the drone note on the fourth string because it's cut off by all these bar chords. So basically it has to be an overdub. And if so, it's carefully hidden and disguised as one guitar part using the same sound and the same panning in the stereo field. So here's closer to the way it sounds on the record. Right, and finally we have the slide break, which is the closest thing to a solo in this tune, and the only time we hear some distortion. I had to use two overdrive pedals in sequence to get the right dirt for this tone. I've got my Black Country Customs Tony Iommi boost going into the broadcast, which are my only two British pedals. Anyway, it's a lot of dirt and I love it. That is all based around an open E blues lick that we all know because you hear it in every slide song. But Page makes it his own by putting it over three chords. You know, he plays it over three different chords and it creates this uplifting moment where the gloom of this song kind of goes away for a minute and the clouds part and we get some hope, maybe a little sunshine, who knows? You would think that that would be it, right? Of course, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a blues lick that we've heard in a zillion different songs. It's already cool that he's playing it over these three different chords, but there is more because it's Jimmy Page. He does three little harmonies that I want to point out to you. Two of them are over the C chord, which is the five. So he goes. You hear that? And you have to wait to play it until the chord hits, because if you play it early, it sounds weird. It doesn't work. So that's part of it. And then uh, the second time he does it, he does it later, he, it goes. And that one's cool because it makes the C into a C7. Which there's no evidence of a C7 anywhere else in the song, but Paige is like, why not a seven? This is blues. The third one, which is probably my favorite, is this little ghost note that happens on the high sort of climactic note of the song. He goes, but instead of just playing that high note, he puts this little ghost, ghosty guy under it. And it makes it sound like we're going to the four chord. But we're not. We're playing it over the one. So it adds a sixth, which is pretty weird. And it's one, another one of those moments where it's kind of wrong. <laughs> but oh so right. If you play it without that little ghost note under it, it doesn't quite sound like when the levee breaks. 
Which leads me to my last thing, which is this wild vibrato that Paige puts on the guitar at the end. I couldn't even play this part on the double neck because the, the neck ends at the 15th fret and I was hitting the body with the slide trying to get that insane vibrato. Now, to be honest with you, I never actually nail it. I never got that vibrato right. It actually made me wonder if Paige played it before they slowed the tape down because it has this woozy sort of drunk quality to it that reminds me of the vocal vibratos on uh, Strawberry Fields Forever, which also had a slowed down tape. Anyway, I tried to play it. I never quite nailed it. I got some of the wildness, but I never got the, that slow speed. And it's wide, folks. That's not as wide as... It's like that. It's intense. Those are all the different ways that Paige makes this one little repeating slide lick into yet another treasure trove of coolness. So mysteries abound, you guys. If you look for it, it's going to be there. If you go, if you zoom in on Paige's stuff... There's always going to be something that sets it apart. And that really is the whole point of this video. On this song, Led Zeppelin, we're going for an apocalyptic, slightly psychedelic take on country blues, evoking images of despair and destruction. And then these moments of light with the guitars, you know, people leaving their homes, not knowing where to go. And then this, this whole other kind of contrasting sound. And Paige said that they did the whole mix in this song to make it sound like it was a storm swirling around Robert Plant's vocals. And they used all kinds of phasing and flanging and extreme panning and backwards echo to paint that picture. But by sticking to classic country blues vocabulary on the guitar, Paige makes sure it never strays too far away from that old Delta sound, even as they're rewriting the rules of modern record production all around it. It's pretty friggin' bananas, in my opinion. So two takeaways from all this for me. Number one, Paige is a genius, as if we didn't know that. But even if he's known for big riffs and flashy solos um, that we all love, some of his best work is blended into the tracks. And number two, even when he's referencing a traditional style like this, Paige keeps it creative and weird with the guitar. I would never have written most of these parts. I get way too precious about correct chords and notes and discrepancies with the bass. And Paige sets a great example for us here of the freedom to turn all that off and just trust the overall vibe and the sound of the band. And the results, as they say, speak for themselves. So for those of you who made it through this whole thing, congratulations. Now I know who my people are. Please let me know some other topics you'd like to explore in future episodes of Rock Splaining. And until then, see you next time, folks. Don't forget to like and subscribe and uh, say hi in the comments. Leave your thoughts. Onwards.